Hey everybody, um, Gary Kessler here, and uh, welcome to my talk about um, put an AIS receiver on a Raspberry Pi. Hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, sort of strange giving a presentation to a bunch of people from an office, but off we go. Um, let me put on my screen here. Hang on just a second. So right now you see me watching you watching me. So we're uh, crossing the beam here. So um, let me get to the right right page. That's not the right page. Let's go here. Now you all know that I watch Longmire. So I'm going to talk about um, setting up an AIS, AIS receiver on a Raspberry Pi. Um, and um, I, I'm not going to assume that anybody has a lot of background in, in any of this, um, but Obviously, through uh, comments and Q and A's, you'll tell me where I went uh, too deep or not deep enough. Um, but in any case, um, th there are a lot of different ways to uh, to to build a receiver in any number of formats. Um, I like the ra Raspberry Pi because it uh, you know provides a mechanism where I can take a cheap machine and and have it dedicated to task. Um, to give you an idea of that, just to tell you where it is we're going. I'm sitting here in my office right now, but over here, if I point this in the right direction, get rid of that, um, here's my TV screen showing my uh, current AIS information that I'm getting. Um, right there, I think if I'm pointing correctly and if I get this in focus, um, there's my Raspberry Pi. And now I'm about five miles from the water, so I'm not getting a lot of signal. But back up here over my shoulder, there's my antenna clipped to my bookcase. Um, and again, connected to the Raspberry Pi, connected to my TV screen. Um, now, in any case, what I'm going to do, I, I have a second Raspberry Pi here. So I'm going to sort of start from there and, you know, just give you a little bit of background. Um, so first of all, I will say I've got some, I've got a page um, on my website. If you go to GaryKessler.net, I egolessly named the domain after myself. Um, if you go to GaryKester.net, um, you can get um, this, uh, th this, this web page. Um, and if you want way more background on AIS, there's a couple of links that I give you up here. Um, actually, <clears throat> the Wikipedia page has a lot of good information, but of course, you can go to the Coast Guard uh, NAB Center and get their overview. Um, International Association of Lighthouse Authorities has a really good overview as well. But in any case, sort of let me tell you where we're started here. Um, now, again, without making too many assumptions about what um, you all have played with or not played with, if you haven't seen before, um, this here is a Raspberry Pi. This one is um, a little bit old. Um, this is, as you can see there, if I can focus this. Um, yeah, there we go. Okay, so th this is the Model B. I, I think there are a couple beyond that now. But in any case, stock standard Raspberry Pi. Um, a whole bunch of USB ports um, and Ethernet port as well. Um, here's where there's an HDMI connection as well as power. Um, this is the general purpose I.O. bus uh, back up in here. And let me go back to uh, to being live and personal. Anyway, so that's you know that that that's your stock standard Raspberry Pi. Now. There are also a number of ways where you can connect a, an AIS receiver. Um, you can get some that'll plug right into the USB port. What I got was um, this device um, from Wegmat, uh, the DAISY AIS receiver. Um, if you get a receiver, it is my recommendation, get a two-channel receiver. Um, so AIS broadcasts on two channels, what they call channel A and channel B. Um, I don't see much use. If you're going to be doing research and you're trying to gather data, I don't see much purpose in getting a single channel AIS receiver. Um, it is true in my experience, most of what I've seen, um, the chips that are broadcasting on channel B are also broadcasting on channel A. But again, there, there's probably no really good reason not to get both channels. Um, in any case, this is, you know, like I said, this is the daisy hat. Um, and for those of you who like to look at circuitry, that's uh, that's the back part. 
So let me go back around here. Um, in any case, so the the first part in getting the uh, getting this together also when you buy the piece parts is you're going to have to buy an antenna. You're probably going to want to buy an antenna. You'll need a marine antenna because that will pick up the the appropriate VHF channels. Um, read carefully on the antenna connector. Um, I found that they use uh, a whole different nomenclature. You know, every industry has its own vernacular. Antenna people have theirs as well. Um, you, you probably want to get um, what, what, what's shown here is the stock standard marine antenna connectors. And um, you're going to need an adapter to go onto the, um, onto the daisy hat, um, which again is what I use. So, so there's the antenna connector on the daisy hat. So what I have here is um, an adapter. This goes onto the daisy hat side. This is a stock standard bayonet connector uh, for here. Here is the antenna connector. This is the part that goes to the marine antenna. And then here is the bayonet, um, the uh, female connector. Anyway, so eventually this piece is gonna go onto the daisy hat. This piece is gonna go on to that connector. And this piece is gonna actually connect to the antenna itself. Oops. Just learning how to use a computer. Anyway, um, the operating system for the Daisy Hat is going to fit onto a micro SD card. Um, and, you know, you've all seen micro SD cards. Um, I would get the biggest one that you can um, just because it provides you more of an opportunity if you need to store a whole bunch of data. Um, micro SD card probably won't fit in your computer. Luckily, most micro SD cards these days come with um, an adapter so that they uh, can plug into stuff. But, you know, basically, um, this is like most of my piece parts. I'll put that there so it'll be in the camera range. So installing Raspbian is something that I'm not going to... Um, Hang on just a second. I'm getting a message here that I think I need to take a look at. Um, they're not, you're not seeing the Raspberry Pi. So um, do I understand you're not seeing my camera? Okay, now, okay, now they are. All right. Anyway, um, on the Raspberry Pi, I chose to install Raspbian and then put open CPN. And so the rest of what I'm going to talk about is basically about that. Um, on my page, I mention that there is a whole different direction you can go in if you want. If you go to the website AIS Hub, I've got a link for their RPI AIS, which is AIS Dispatcher for uh, Raspberry Pi. And what Dispatcher will do, it basically acts as an intermediary to accept AIS feeds and then pop them out where you want them to go. Um, that site is a really excellent site and has a lot of really good information as well. Um, but that's not the direction I'm going to go in right now. Um, what I'm going to talk about is um, just, again, you stock standard, pretty much vanilla with my Raspberry Pi um, using the Noobs operating system. and um, again, the operating system is going to go on the micro SD card. There are a lot of places out there that give instructions for how to do this. Um, and the reason I put this page together actually is I don't really have a lot of information here that's really unique to anything that, you know, that, that I made up. But I found I had to go to about a dozen sites to get all the information together so that I could actually figure out how to do this. So I decided to build this page because for me, it provided a roadmap that if I need to do it again in six months, um, I've got a place to go. In any case, relatively easy to um, get noobs onto the micro SD card. Um, and then basically, after you um, have put the operating system, I'm gonna get this off of my card here. Um, so I've got the operating system on my micro SD card and it just goes into the, uh, oh, there it is. It just goes into the Raspberry Pi, and that is all of your local storage. 
That is your disk drive. That's your operating system um, and your bootable device. So, of course, the joy with the Raspberry Pi is um, you can have a whole slew of different operating systems and you change the personality of the Raspberry Pi by what SD card you put in. One of the reasons I like having a big SD card, like I said, is if I'm doing local storage of stuff, um, I can keep it all on the SD card. Clearly, with four USB ports, I could also plug in you know, all the external storage I want. So once you have gotten the, um, the, the, the software installed, um, you're going to plug the thing in. At this point, you need to have some I.O. devices. So you do need to have um, a keyboard and a mouse and a monitor of some sort, um, at least for the initial phases. And so um, when you start the system up, you'll get some sort of boot screen and you'll tell it, you know, you want to install full Raspbian and just let it go. Now, um, at this point, you now have an operating system. You now need to configure the Raspberry Pi. So I give you a little bit of instruction how to do that. But what I'm going to do is try to show you a little bit more dynamically and live. So um, the application menu is usually up in the upper left. It's the Raspberry Pi um, icon. And if you go down to Preferences and then Raspberry Pi Configuration, here's where you get to configure the things about your system. So here's where you can put in your password, you can put the name of the computer, um, and all this kind of little stuff. One of the most important parts is going to be on the interfaces. If you want remote access to the Raspberry Pi, and I recommend that you do, um, be sure to enable SSH and VNC. Um, SSH is going to use TCP port 22. Uh, VNC, I think, uses port 5900. Um, you probably want to have the serial port enabled either, since you're going to put something on, onto that serial port. Um, and then there's some other things you can configure here. One that um, I do recommend is to set your locale. Um, if nothing else, be sure you're in the right time zone. Um, and then you might want to do some other things about you know what country you're in, what language, and all those kind of things. Um, but those are the two biggies. Um, you do need to set the Wi-Fi country. Um, and I, I must admit, I know you need to do it, and I haven't explored deeply as to what happens if you configure a different country. But, um, well, anyway, I'm going to cancel this because I didn't really want to accidentally change anything. So anyway, so this is all the stuff, like I said, you know, you can configure on the Raspberry Pi. Um, now, it turns out, of course, you can use the GUI or you can use a command line. Um, and here's some instructions on using the command line. I just do a, 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 a sudo, you know, raspy dash config, and it'll pop up actually the same screen. Now, you might want to put your Raspberry Pi onto a Wi Fi network. And if you have um, a Wi Fi network that um, it's broadcasting as SSID and doesn't have a password, and you're not physically connected on the Ethernet port, the Raspberry Pi should pick up that Wi-Fi network. However, if you want to connect to anything else, like a Wi-Fi network that doesn't broadcast its ID um, and or um, it requires a password, then there is a file that you need to edit and put the information in about that, um, about that network. Um, this is one of the reasons I'm not going to show you um, the file that's sitting on my Raspberry Pi because everything is in plain text and I'm not, you know, don't know that I want to share everybody my password right now. Anyway, so what you need to do is go to this file, the Etsy underscore supplicant um, dot com file. Um, Nano is a um, nice little GUI editor um, that comes on the Raspberry Pi. In any case, so what I've done here is I'm showing you how you could configure two different um, wireless networks. So in the first case, I've got um, a guest network. There's no password, but in this case, the SSID um, um, it, it, it is not being broadcast. So the SSID for the guest network is guest. Um, anyway, so that's what that would look like. Then I've got another network called owner. And owner, in this case, does have a password. The password is secret. Um, and it uses WPA. 
So this is what those kind of commands would look like to um, you know indicate that network. So let me just go back here for a second, and I want to get back to my video actually. Oh, here, I'll just click the video. Oh, just click the video off. Sorry about that. All right. Sorry, we're all still learning the tools, particularly me. All right, so I'm gonna go back to Firefox here. So basically at this point, you've got your Raspberry Pi now uh, can listen on SSH or VNC. You've got it connected to the wireless. So at this point, you could take out your, you know, um, well, keep plugging into your monitor if you want, but you don't need your keyboard anymore and you don't need your mouse because you could now all do that remotely if you want. Um, I do have a couple notes about the screen resolution because I found that um, I had to play around a little bit with that. Um, and um, you can go into the uh, config.txt file, which is in the boot directory. And um, there are a number of uh, different screen sizes you can try. Um, what I found on this was I had to play around a little bit and experiment, and eventually I found something that worked. So now that I got the Raspberry Pi going, um, the next thing is installing the Daisy Hat. Now, again, I'm going to assume that many of you have played with this kind of stuff before, but there's probably some of you who haven't. So um, on the Raspberry Pi, I've got these two rows of pins um back in back in here and on the daisy hat i've got the socket that goes into it let me get that a little bit further down and all i can say is if you've never played around with um you know putting sockets onto pins just do it slowly carefully and make sure everything's lined up the first time the other thing is you'll notice um i i actually have this in a case um you don't actually need to have it in a case but i thought it was better more better protected that way. Um, so I mounted the Raspberry Pi um, onto the case. You see the standoffs. Um, if you're going to do this, um, there are some standoffs for the um, for the Daisy Hat as well. You know, this is the time to put those in. And then, like I said, it's a matter of, you know, be sure that you've lined up the socket correctly this way. Um, and actually, it's not. But mm. I. Can't, I can't see it as well as the camera can. And be sure that you've lined it up correctly, you know, here as well. And once you have everything lined up, let me try to get this in here. This is, this is the problem with doing anything live, isn't it? Um, just be sure that you squeeze evenly on both sides and slowly. And there you go. I mean, it's like that. Um, and then, of course, you screw it to the standoffs. Um, and then you build the rest of the case. Um, you can probably guess this is why I um, I took a part one to put back together, but I'm not using that live because I'm not going to square everything back in together. Anyway, once you get the Daisy Hat installed, um, that's really all you need to do. Um, I give some instructions on how to load a program called GPIO that allows you to look at your uh, GPIO pins. You can do that or not do that, depending upon um, if you want to you know, track all those things. Um, I put in the software, but it's absolutely not necessary to do. Um, there's also a program called Screen, which, again, uh, provides you some useful information about anything on your serial board um, on the Raspberry Pi. But it's not essential to the operation of um, anything related to AIS. So I'm going to sort of skip over that. And what I want to do is I want to bring you to OpenCPN. So um, I'm running OpenCPN on the Raspberry Pi. I'm also running it on my um, um, on, on my Mac. And so there, there's slightly different views uh, here from what I'll I'll, sh I'll show you um, on the Raspberry Pi. But the OpenCPN is Open Chart Plotter. Um, OpenCPN, <clears throat> excuse me. OpenCPN runs on just about all software platforms except iOS. Um, and basically, you know, like with any um, electronic chart display, 
You see all the targets out here. The targets are color coded actually by type of vessel. And with AIS, they're identifying their type of vessel. Right here, I've got one. I don't really know much about it, um, but it apparently is a, a ship from Norway. Um, it's a class A vessel, which means we're gonna be getting more information on its position reports. But you'll see here, you know, you've know, you got its speed, its course, heading, uh, rate of turn. Um, a vessel like this at this speed ought to be broadcasting, well, certainly no more than about 10 seconds before their transmission. I'm a little bit surprised that we're up to four minutes now. Possibly that's due to range. Um, but in any case, I can look at any one of these other vessels, uh, baby cakes, I can know that boat, uh, just because I see it in the harbor all the time. Um, right now it's probably parked. Um, it's a smaller vessel. It's a smaller vessel, by which I mean it's a yacht. Um, it's a class B vessel, so it's not required to transmit AIS messages. Um, but in any case, so OpenCPN, again, being open source and has a nice version for the Raspberry Pi, um, you can you know, download the software um, at the opencpn.org site. They have more documentation than you can shake a stick at. Um, but again, there's all sorts of um, information there about how to install OpenCDN. Um, and again, I tried to put everything sort of in one place that you know steps you through. Most importantly is building yourself a PGP key file on the Raspberry Pi and um, how to be sure that you get the key so that you can actually um, install OpenCPN when you have you know gone, gone through the first process here. Um, so once you've got the key, you know, here are the steps right here to install OpenCPN. Um, and like most things, you're waiting for a lot longer than you're actually typing in instructions. But once you get OpenCPN on your computer, um, you now have other things you need to play with. So I'm gonna go back to OpenCPN here, and you, you're now gonna need to configure OpenCPN. Now, one of the things I wanna show you because I found this to be, and continue to find it to be one of the, um, this, if, if anything in OpenCPN is difficult, this is the most difficult step. And that is getting charts. So um, you have to be familiar with um, charts and how they're organized, uh, at least in, um, in the United States. So when you wanna add a new chart, and you can get charts, as you may know, from the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, from NOAA. You can download every chart in the United States in a variety of formats. Um, you can download them as a PDF, so that as a person you can read them, or you can download them in um, a number of electronic formats, ENC being the most common. Um, and so basically what you need to do if you want to add a chart is, um, well, you can go to chart group here if you want. Um, you can add new groups of charts. Um, the easiest way is to go to chart downloader. And in this case, you can see that I have four catalogs on my computer right now. I've got the catalog for California, Florida, Connecticut, and although it's not all shown here, um, for Coast Guard District 1. Um, the reason I downloaded all of District 1's catalog was because I wanted um, charts from Vermont, but they don't actually have charts for Vermont. Uh, the Vermont charts are in the District 1 catalog. So that's one of the other things you sort of sometimes need to fight through. But um, so if you want to add a chart, you just go to add. Um, and then you get to choose where do I, from where do I want my charts? I usually want USA and NOAA charts. So I open up that. And then I can decide, okay, do I want the RNC or the ENC charts? The RNC or the raster graphic, um, they're not used very much anymore, or I can get ENC charts. And now I can download all the ENCs. I can look them up by district. Um, I can look them up by state, look it up by region, what have you. Um, so if I wanted to look it up by state, for example, well, obviously here's my states. So let's say I wanted to get charts from Illinois. I could go to Illinois, click OK, and 
it now has just added um, the chart, but what it wants me to do is now update. So the next thing I need to do is update. So it gets all of those, and now you'll notice down here, it has a list. Now, those of you that are familiar with charts know that the charts are numbered. Um, the numbers are only good in OpenCPN as a mechanism to help you find the name of the chart, because you'll notice in the catalog down here, um, everything's by name. So like I said, you just need to know the name of the chart. If I wanted to download, let's say, the Chicago Lakefront chart, I merely click on it. Um, I download selected charts. And now those charts are available to me in OpenCPM. So I'm going to say OK. So it's all here. And, and, and there's actually, there really is a reason I'm showing you this. All right. So if I back out of here all the way, I'm going to take a look at the United States. And what you're going to see, well, maybe I'll go in a little closer. What you're going to see here is a bunch of green boxes. These are all of the places where I have downloaded charts. So remember I had the California catalog? Well, all I have from California is some charts up in the San Francisco Bay Area. Here's Lake Champlain, my Vermont charts. I have some charts from the new London area in Connecticut. The chart we just downloaded in Illinois. Um, here are some of the Florida charts that I have. This is mostly the Pensacola area, and the rest of what I have is here where I am in Daytona. So I have access to every chart in North America, but of course I haven't downloaded all of them because, you know, I'm not looking at all of them. And right now, for the feed that I have, I really only care about this area here because for me, again, in Daytona, this is the Intracoastal Waterway um in my neck of the woods so it's going to take a couple seconds while all of this reloads but um anyway so hopefully you sort of get the idea here anyway that is the process that i describe here about downloading charts um now the next thing you need to do is figure out okay i'm going to display ais data where am i getting it from so once again, I'm going to go back to here and I'm going to go to the connections. And so there's a variety of ways in which I can get data. Um, I have myself set up three connections. One of them is that I get data from an antenna that I have at the university where I teach at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. So I've got um, a device there called ssia-ais.erau.edu. And if I connect to that device over the internet on port 4000, that's where I get a feed. Um, it's at this point public. I mean, any of you could point there as well if you're interested in what's going on in Daytona. Um, I'm going to move this out of the way here a little bit. Um, all of these boats that I'm seeing here, that's coming from that feed from Riddle. Now, um, on this particular computer, I'm not set up on the serial interface because I don't have an antenna on, on this computer. But um, if I switch back over to my, I'll go back to my Raspberry Pi, you'll notice the interface is slightly different. If I go here and I look at connections, um, you can see that I have, I've got a bunch of connections, but the two that are active, one is coming in again from SSIA. Um, dash AIS dot erau dot edu. Um, and the other I'm set to the serial port. So my Raspberry Pi can also um, be pulling in stuff from the antenna. So my office is about, oh, I would say five or six miles from the river and from the ocean. And since you saw my antenna, it's only about seven feet high. I'm not picking up a lot of feeds. Um, so most of it's coming in from the antenna at the university, which is, like I said, up about 75 feet up. I will tell you um, one funny story, because um, when I was first experimenting with this, I had all of this stuff at home, and home is 10 miles from the ocean. So I'm fooling around with it one day, and, and right here, 
Um, this window here is the NMEA debug window because I've checked the box. So you see I'm getting traffic and you can see where it's all coming from. So I'm sitting at home and I'm not getting any data, but I'm not expecting to. And all of a sudden I get a hit. I have an AIS message come in on my serial port and I go crazy because I'm very excited. So I take the message and I parse it and I look at the latitude and longitude and I position exactly where the thing is. And it turns out, I live about one mile east of I-95, and the latitude and longitude showed a boat going at approximately, you know, on a heading of approximately 210 degrees at 65 knots. And I said, there ain't a boat anywhere doing 65 knots around here. Well, the latitude and longitude put this boat in the southbound lane of I-95. So clearly this boat's sitting on somebody's trailer, they didn't turn off their AIS, and this guy's zooming down the road, and I got one of its transmissions. I was very excited. Anyway, um, I'm going to go back here. So this is how you set up your connections. So you can set up a serial connection, as I show here. Um, if you set up a serial connection, it's going to automatically be NMEA 0183 protocol. Um, you're going to want to set the, the data rate to be 38400. Uh, because that's probably what the data rate's going to be over the air. Um, or you can set up network connections. And for the network connections, it's going to need an IP address or uh, a host name, and it'll need the port on which to read. So it's getting all of this, obviously, over the network. And again, you've just seen already, but this is what the, uh, what the debug window looks like. And um, let's see. So this, this was stuff coming in on a serial port. Um, this was stuff coming in on a network port. I'm not 100% sure why I decided to hide that IP address, um, but I did. Um, now, it also turns out that if you want to get one of these feeds live, if you go through OpenCPN, one of your problems is there's no way to take the information from the debug window and get it in any usable form. One thing you can do, though, is um, go around to a terminal window. I'm gonna go around to a terminal window here. I'll make a new one. And if I just do, you know, an NC to SSIA-AIS.eroute.edu, port 4000. Um, hopefully I'll start getting some data. There we go. So I can get the feed this way. Um, and this is something I'm actually going to talk about in a later talk when I, um, when I talk about AIS and GPS spoofing. But um, one form of spoofing is a replay attack. So a replay attack, well, just like the name sounds, I mean, you replay old data. Um, this is a way of collecting data. So I've actually written a program that'll do this for you, but you can also do it for yourself. Um, the, the, there, there's a reason you don't want to collect data in this format and then replay it. Um, and the reason is you don't have a timestamp and you don't have relative timing, but more on that later. In any case, let me go back to this. So, like I said, th there are a variety of ways where you can get the raw feed if you just want to see a raw feed. Um, now one of the other things you can do, of course, is you can set up open CPN to display stuff that you are sending it from your computer. So you can either um, set up OpenCPN to read from somebody else's TCP socket, or you can set up OpenCPN and write to um, OpenCPN. So in this case, um, let's see, when I set up my network connection up here, um, You'll notice I was receiving input on this port. I can set up another port that I can then output on this port. So what I now need is if I have a program that will write to port 7777 on this computer, as I've configured it here, this provides another mechanism where I can show stuff. So again, um, I'll be talking about that later on as well. So in this case, what I did, was I set something up where I'm, my serial port is an input port, network port 
port 7777 is an output port. And this is what the debug window looks like because it shows that I'm reading on the serial port and writing to port 7777. Again, there's a variety of ways of, you know, using OpenCPN for some really, really, you know, clever stuff. Um, anyway, um, so I mentioned this, this program that'll read for you. So I have a program called Timestamp Data. It's on my website. Um, uh, it's software that's available, and, and we'll be making that available here. But if you run timestamp data, um, here's the help file. <coughs> Excuse me. Again, um, you know, if, if you specify um, an, an IP address and a port number, and whether you want to use TCP or UDP, um, default to TCP, you can now download data for, you know, some period of time. The program defaults to five minutes, but you could set it, you know, as far up to a week if you want. Um, and what this will do is this will download the data and it will include a timestamp. So what it does is, as it shows here, it creates a program or it creates an output file that looks like this. It's, it's basically a pipe symbol um, delimited file. Um, so here you can see I've got, you know, um, the year, day, date, hour, minute, second, and then the Unix epic time format of that. Now, the reason I'm using the pipe symbol is because if I let people choose their own delimiter, somebody will end up choosing a delimiter like a comma. Comma is not a unique um, character in an AIS message. Um, there are a lot of symbols that you might see. So pipe, I knew, would, would be at least unique. If you don't like pipe, you can go into your text file and do a global search and replace for a different delimiter. But just be careful that you don't duplicate something. Um, the other thing is by having here the um, the relative timestamp, the message I just brought in, if I turn around and replay this, um, I can replay it and I get the same relative timing. So, you know, th th this really was not designed for a replay attack. It was designed so that I could gather data and then replay it in real time and, you know, actually see what was happening. Because um, I have another program called Play AIS where I can replay this file. I can actually speed it up and slow it down as well. Um, anyway, so I've already talked a little bit about sending data to OpenCPN. Um, if, if you don't have a timestamp, um, everything just overwrites itself. And so if you've got like um, 10 AIS messages from the same vessel and you replay the file, um, what you'll see is the last message because the first nine got overwritten by the by all the following ones. Another tool you should know about for this is um, there's a really, really cool NMEA simulator. Um, and it generates NMEA sentences and uh, or AIS sentences. And it is really, really a cool program. Um, for good or for bad, it only runs on Chrome. Um, can't explain that. This is the only application I actually run Chrome on. Um, but as you can see here from the dashboard um, and the other ways in which you can set this up, um, you can pretty much simulate whatever you'd like. You can put yourself in a particular position. You can get your vessel headed in a certain direction. Um, you can give yourself a rate of turn. You can do all sorts of cool things. And then what you can do is you can hook yourself up to a server. And you can actually output the information that the simulator is creating. So you could create information such as this. Um, I can set up my, um, my, my, my simulator. I have it write to OpenCPN. And then I can have it, you know, play on OpenCPN. It's really, really a cool tool. So last but not least, um, how do you interpret this data? Um, for those of you who um, like to get into code, uh, Eric Raymond has a um, AIS protocol decoding page. Um, you can see it's purple. I go there a lot. Um, and, um, well, I mean, I may as well go there. Um, he, he has here some, like I said, a, a lot of information um, about the NMA0183 uh, format. Um, not only the format, but what all the messages are, what the contents are, to a certain degree, how to encode the contents. Um, 
AIS does not show information in any sort of clear way that a human can understand. Um, so for example, you know, we've already seen a couple of these. This message right here, where I'm sort of moving my mouse, the AIVDM, comma one, comma one, comma, comma, A, comma, you know, all that jazz. Um, there's a special encapsulation method that AIS messages use. Um, Eric's page talks a little bit about that, um, how you can get everything into a six bit byte and um, armored ASCII and all that kind of stuff. But what you can do is you can take these AIS messages that you get and you can go to a place such as the site I've gone to here is Maritech Solutions, plop in the AIS message and it will interpret it for you. Um, there are a whole bunch of other AIS parsers online and I've given you some links on my page here. Um, and I've written a bunch of tools for this because for some of the research that I wanted to do, I was trying to create some unique AIS messages. And so I had to create a parser. So I actually have an entire suite of, um, of, of tools. And um, again, I'll talk about this a little bit more with the AIS spoofing stuff. But, um, but if you go to my software page, you can download all of these. But if I take that same message, um, or I guess it's not the same message as was above, but, but some AIS message. And if um, all of my stuff is command line and it's all written in Perl, don't get me started on why. Um, and in any case, it'll interpret, you know, the sentence for you. Um, this is in fact an AIS um, mobile device. It's used, it's a, a VDM, meaning it's a VHF data link message, which is a nice way of saying this is a message coming from another boat as opposed to my message going out. Um, here's all the contents of a type one message, which this is. Um, it's a class A big boat uh, position report. Um, here's the, the, the device identifier. Every device has a unique nine digits identifier. This gives you all the other information, um, including longitude and a URL so that you can click if you want to see a map. Um, and there are a number of places where you can get data. Um, I've already mentioned um, the site that is at my university. Um, you can also go to places like AIS Hub, and um, they um, also are getting a whole bunch of information. Um, there are some other places online if you can find them that are, you know, give you some more localized information. Um, if you find more places you'd like to share with me, I would be delighted to have you share with me. Um, and the, the format that we most commonly see over the air, like I, I keep saying, um, NMEA is the National Maritime Electronics Association and the 0183 standard, um, which is about circa 1986. Um, that's still the most commonly used standard that we see. Um, in about 1999, they came out with NMEA 2000. As we speak, we're getting prepared to release the OneNet standard. It is very, very difficult to find out how, how to do any of the coding on 2000 or OneNet because it's all highly proprietary. Um, and everybody who has a copy signs a non-disclosure agreement. But there is a project called the CAN Boat Project. Um, the, the, the CAN bus is used with NMEA 2000. IP version 6 is used as the transmission for OneNet. Um, NMEA 0183, basically everything runs over a serial bus. So a lot of the stuff that I'm showing you here with OpenCPN, we're pulling in from over the air. It turns out if you can get onto the serial bus, you can get information right off the boat. Um, and there are a variety of ways, I'm not gonna get into that here, but there's a variety of ways of in, in, injecting messages directly on the boat, either through the CAN bus, if you're NMEA 2000, um, and or through the serial on uh, NMEA 0183. So um, I'm gonna go back here for just a second. Everybody can see, everybody can see now. Um, I mean, this is basically what I have on, on the device. Uh, and so I certainly would like to leave this open to um, questions if I have uh, said anything for which you have questions.
scrolling back up here to see if I can find the uh, AIS text appears closed. So anyway, does anybody have uh, questions that you want to ask or um, anything like that? I'm detecting silence. Well, I'm going to hang around here for a few minutes. Um, I've got another talk in about 18 minutes, um, and but I'm, but I'm going to stay connected till then. So if anybody has anything, feel free to um, to ask away. Oh, okay. How close do you have to be to receive signals is one of the questions I just got. So um, I didn't really go into the AIS protocol, but the AIS protocol is basically designed for ships to talk to each other within about a 10 to 20 nautical mile range. Um, so obviously you're gonna get messages further away if your antenna is higher up. My um, antenna at my building at work is 75 feet high. And um, I have gotten messages from as much as uh, 80 or 90 miles um, with a normal ship antenna that might only be, let's say, um, at, 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 at most, probably 10 to 15 meters high, they're probably getting, you know, in the 15, 20 mile range. Okay, let's see. I just got a message asking about the Trend Micro Library. So um, I actually haven't. Um, oops, let's see. I have to get to my video now. Ah, never change a, a working thing. Um, so at, at my website, I talk about the AIS Black Toolkit, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. So um, a team of people from Trend Micro, led by a fellow named Marco Balduzzi, um, has been talking about AIS issues for a long time. Um, in any case, the AIS Black Toolkit is a Python-based toolkit where they also wanted to be able to generate um, any AIS messages that they wanted. And so um, I, I've used their toolkit a little bit. Um, I've not used the part of their toolkit where they actually push out messages using um, um, software-defined libraries or uh, software-defined uh, radio. Um, their messages were basically a demonstration of capability that they could do it, but they used a lot of defaults that put them like in Italy and stuff like that. So when I built my tools, they were a little bit, um, inspired by, you know, what they did, but I tried to build it so that I used defaults per the standards so that I could create legal messages. But, um, a lot of you may be familiar with the program HPing3 allows you to build any TCP IP message you want, no matter how bogus. Um, so I was inspired to call my stuff AIS ping for that reason. I mean, I can build legal AIS messages. I can also build entirely bogus AIS messages because AIS won't stop me from doing that. And that's one of the protocol vulnerabilities. Um, and again, I'll talk more about that later on. But, um, but in any case, um, I, I, I had success using the AIS Black Toolkit, but I haven't used the Black Toolkit probably in a year, year and a half. Um, I am pleased to say that one of my programs found its way into the Black Toolkit, um, the menu program, but uh, the rest of it's on my site. Is the CAN project the only NMA 2000 project? Oh, and now I'm gonna have to go look at that one. Hang on just a second. Gonna run over to Slack here. Um, let's see. Is the CAN project the only NMA 2000 project you know of? Um, it it is. It, it's the only. Well, by the standard, that's what it runs over. So the problem with NMA 2000, like I said, is it's proprietary. You need to buy the standard. Um, I have a copy of the standard with permission. Um, and when they sent it to me for research purposes, it's actually watermarked with my name in it. 
Um, they really are trying to discourage people from, you know, spreading the thing around. Um, and everybody has to sign a non-disclosure saying that they won't release it. Um, and it's been around for 20 years and nobody's released it yet. So they must be reasonably successful. A message that waiting for one more message. Let me try the AIS text. There's a, maybe a message there. Um, okay. Um, readout's making a comment here about DEF CON 2016 open source project release for the J1939 truck duck. Um, okay. Good to know. Um, be adapted by people willing, willing to help port it. <laughs> well, <laughs> Where I come from, reverse engineering is a noble cause. When I was a young person, first in computers, I probably shouldn't age myself too much. Nothing, for, first of all, nobody had ever heard of open source. Um, and, 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 and the two words is a phrase didn't exist. Everything was proprietary. The only way to learn anything was to break the computer. And once you realize that you broke it, I mean, I was of a mind once I broke it, I only had to break it once. Um, because computer security in the 1970s was when you broke something and you went to the network people and said, Hey, if you do X, Y, and Z, your network will break. Their answer was, well, don't do that. We would say, Oh, okay. We won't. We'll go do something else. Um, but that's how you learn stuff. Well, I'll tell you what, I have that it is 2.50 where I am, so it must be 11.50 back on the coast. Um, if, if there's, uh, like I said, I'm going to hang around for another 10 minutes or so for my next talk, but um, I'll, I, I'm, I'm prepared to close it now. Um, you know, thanks for the questions. Thanks for being here. Um, if you have any questions, if you get to my website um, or any of the links that are here, there's tons of ways to get a hold of me. Feel free. Um, to do that. Um, I love talking about this stuff. Happy to help out in any way I can. And uh, in about 10 minutes, I'll start talking a little about GPS spoofing and AIS spoofing and all that kind of stuff.